is paper two of the uh, Leaving Cert Higher Level Mock Exam from 2019. So we'll jump straight in there with uh, question one. Uh, question one is a probability question. And part A asks uh, 15 tickets, each printed with a different whole number from 1 to 15, are placed in the drum. Tickets are drawn at random from the drum and then replaced. Find the probability that the first three tickets drawn have different prime numbers. So the important things here are that the tickets are replaced after the draw, after each draw, and that they have different prime numbers. From 1 to 15, we have a total of 6 prime numbers. Um, and we want the probability that we get 3 different prime numbers. Well, the probability of three different prime is uh, the probability of getting the first prime number on your first uh, on your first draw. That'll be six out of fifteen. Times the probability of getting a different prime number. Well, there's only five prime numbers left, but we still have fifteen tickets because we've replaced the first ticket. And then for the third prime number, it's going to be four over fifteen because there's four prime num numbers left and. 15 tickets in the drum. So that works out to be 8 over uh, 225, or you can put that into a decimal. Either answer is fine, 0 0.0355. Part 2 says all the tickets are replaced in the drum and redrawn at random without replacement. Find the probability that the first three tickets drawn all have odd numbers or all have even numbers. So from the numbers 1 to 15, we have 8 odd and 7 even. So we want the probability that they're all odd or all even. So we'll work out the probability that they're all odd and then add it to the probability that they're all even. Uh, this time we have without replacement so that means the denominator is going to reduce each time. Uh, so the probability that they're all odd that is 8 over 15 times 7 over 14 times 6 over 13 and we're going to add that to the probability that they're all even. The probability that they're all even is 7 over 15 times 6 over 14 times 5 over 13 and then just put that whole thing into your calculator and it should come out as one fifth or as a decimal 0 0.2 part 3 find the probability that the product of the numbers on the first three tickets drawn is even so we want there's there's three ways that the the product of the first three numbers could be even we could get three even numbers that would be the probability of even 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 because any even number by an even number is itself even uh, we could get the probability of an even number times an even number times an odd number so even by even is even and even by odd is even so that would be even as well or we could get the probability of um, even times odd times odd. So odd times odd is even, and then odd times even is even as well. So those are the ways that you could get um, an even number uh, as the, the product of the first three numbers. Now, there's three ways that this could happen. So we have even, even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, even. So that's times three. And this here, the same as times three. So we could do this, work out all of these uh, probabilities and the permutations here. Or we could notice that the only thing missing from here is odd, odd, odd. So if we do our one minus the probability that all of them are odd, then that will 
be much quicker and it'll give us the answer. So that'll be one minus the probability of odd, odd, odd. So odd, odd, odd would be eight over 15 times seven over 14 times six over 13. And that works out to be 57 over 65. Or as a decimal, that would be 0 0.8769. On to part B then. So uh, B says A and B are independent, independent events such that the probability of A is 0 0.3 and the probability of A union B is 0 0.55. Uh, find the probability of B, the probability that B occurs, and give your answer in fraction form. So it might help to draw a Venn diagram for this. So this is the Venn diagram that I've drawn. I have A, I have B, uh, I have my universal set out here. Uh, the first thing that I'm gonna put in is the pro probability of A union B is 0 0.55. So the probability of neither happening must be 0 0.45. So that'll go outside here. Um, I'm going to let the intersection equal to x. Um, I know that the probability of a is 0 0.3. So this whole part for a is 0 0.3. So this bit must be 0 0.3 minus my x that I have here. And then everything else goes in here. So that would be uh, 0 0.55 in total minus x minus 0 0.3 minus x so those x's would cancel so it'll be 0 0.55 minus 0 0.3 and that would leave me with 0 0.25 uh, now we're told that a and b are independent so if they're independent that means that the probability of a intersection b is the same as or equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So this would be the formula that you remember from class. So the probability of A intersection B, that's X. Uh, the probability of A is 0 0.3. Uh, that's A altogether, so 0 0.3 altogether. Times the probability of B which is 0 0.25 plus x. So if we work through that, then we can solve for x, and then we can find the probability of b. So x is equal to uh, 0 0.3 times 0 0.25 is 0 0.075, and 0 0.3 times x is 0 0.3x. Um, x minus 0 0.3x is 0 0.7x is equal to 0 0.075. Divide across by 0 0.7, so x is equal to 0 0.075 divided by 0 0.7. Uh, that works out to be 3 over 28. So x is 3 over 28. Uh, 0 0.25 plus 3 over 28, so 0 0.325 uh, plus 3 over 28 is equal to 5 over 14. And remember, they want it in fraction form, so you would lose a couple of marks if you didn't write it in fraction form. And the last part of this question, find the conditional probability a given b that is the probability that a will happen given that b has already happened so we have a formula for this it's the probability of a given b uh, that's equal to the probability of a intersection b divided by the probability of b so the probability of a intersection b that was our x from before, so that's 3 over 28. And the probability of b, we just calculated, 5 over 14. 
So divide this by this and we get 3 over 10 or in decimal if you like 0 0.3. Okay so on to question 2 uh, which is a coordinate geometry question. Uh, part A says the line 3x minus 4y plus 6 equal to 0 intersects the x-axis at A and the y-axis at B. Find the equation of the perpendicular bisector of AB and give your answer in the form of AX plus BY plus C is equal to zero, where A, B and C are elements of Z. That will come important uh, towards the end when we're just writing the final, uh, the final answer. But first of all, we've got to start working on this, which is the equation of our line. It intersects the x-axis at A and the y-axis at B. So we need to find the points A and B first of all. So it's going to intersect the x-axis uh, at y equal to 0. So if we let y equal to 0 in here, we'll find the point. So that's 3x minus 4 times 0 plus 6 is equal to 0. So then 3x uh, is equal to minus 6, so x is equal to minus 2. So that gives us the point A, which is minus 2, 0. And then for the point B, that's where it crosses the y-axis. So at the point uh, B, x is equal to 0. So we have 3 times 0 minus 4y plus 6 is equal to 0. That means minus 4y is equal to minus 6. y is equal to 6, uh, minus 6 divided by minus 4, which is 1.5. So that gives us the point B, which is 0, 1.5. So we have our two points A and B. Now, the equation, we're looking for the equation of the perpendicular bisector. So the bisector is going to be the midpoint of AB. So if we find the midpoint of AB next, we have a formula for the midpoint of AB. That's x1 plus x2 over 2 and y1 plus y2 over 2. So filling in the values, uh, that's minus 2 plus 0 over 2 and 0 plus 1.5 over 2. And that works out to be minus 1 comma 0 0.75. So that's the point um, that is the, the midpoint of AB. So that point is going to be on this equation. To find the equation of a, of a line, we need a point and the slope. So we want to find the slope of the perpendicular line. First of all, we find the slope of AB, and then we can find the perpendicular slope then from that. So two ways we could find the slope. We could uh, rearrange this into y equals mx plus c, or we can use the slope formula. So either way uh, is, is acceptable. I'm going to use the slope formula, so the slope of AB, uh, the formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, that's 1.5 minus 0 over 0 minus minus 2. And that works out to be 3 over 4. So 3 over 4 is the slope of AB, so the perpendicular slope then which is the slope of our line that we're looking for, is going to be minus 4 over 3. So you flip it and you change the sign. So 3 over 4 is minus 4 over 3, the perpendicular slope. So we have a point, we have the slope, so now we can use our equation of a line formula. y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. So that's y minus 0 0.75, that's our y1, that's our x1, is equal to m, which is minus 4 over 3, times x, 
minus x1, so that's minus minus 1, which is plus 1. So now it's just working through it and making sure we get it in this form here. So first thing, multiply everything by 3. So that would be 3y uh, minus 0 0.75 times 3 is minus 2.25. On this side, multiply by 3. The minus 4 over 3 becomes minus 4. So I'm going to multiply out uh, the brackets then. It would be minus 4x minus 4. We want everything to the left hand side, so that would be 4x plus 3y plus 1.75 is equal to 0. Be careful at this point, you might think you're finished, but it does say where a, b and c are all elements of z. z is the integers, so we need whole numbers. So I'm going to have to multiply uh, by something uh, to get this 1.75 to be a whole number. I can multiply it by 4 and that will become 7. So if I multiply everything by 4, that will be 16x plus 12y plus 7 is equal to 0. So that there is the equation of our perpendicular bisector to AB. Okay, uh, part B then. The equations of the diagonals of a parallelogram are x minus y minus 7 is equal to 0 and x plus y minus 1 is equal to 0. The line x minus 5y minus 7 equal to 0 contains one side of the parallelogram. Find the area of the parallelogram. Now this question, it's not too bad, but it is quite tedious. I definitely recommend starting by drawing some sort of a diagram. So I'm going to draw, um, basically plot these three lines and see uh, see what they are, see where, what they look like. So I'll draw my x and y axis here like this. Uh, I'll start with x minus y minus 7 is equal to 0. The easiest way to plot this point is to find the x and y intercepts. So to find the x intercept, I let y equal to 0. So that will be x minus 0. So x minus 7 is equal to 0. So x is equal to 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then let, for the y-intercept, let x equal to 0. So that would be minus 7, or minus y minus 7 is equal to 0. So y is equal to minus 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's my first line there. That's x minus y minus 7 is equal to 0. For the next one, x plus y minus 1 is equal to 0. Let's do the same thing. Uh, let for the x intercept, y is equal to 0. So x minus 1 is equal to 0. x is equal to 1. That's up here. Do the same thing then for the, uh, sorry, that was for the y-intercept. Uh, for the x-intercept then, let y equal to 0. So x uh, minus 1 is equal to 0. So uh, x is equal to 1. So get the point, uh, the y-intercept, x was 1, and the x-intercept, y was 1. So that's this one here. Okay. I think I explained the first point wrong, but it, that those are the correct points. Uh, and then for the third one, the line x minus 5y minus 7 is equal to 0. So to find the x-intercept, we let y equal to 0. So that's x minus 7 is equal to 0. x is equal to 7. That's this point here again. And then for the y-intercept, uh, let x equal to 0. So minus 5y minus 7 is equal to 0. Minus 5y is equal to 7. Y is equal to minus 7 over 5, which is minus 7 over 5, which is around about here. So that is our third line. So this one, again, was x plus y minus 1 is equal to 0. And then this one here is my 5, uh, sorry, my x 
uh, minus 5y minus 7 is equal to 0. So it's a little bit tedious to draw that out, but that gives me um, gives me the line that contains one side of the parallelogram. So this is the line that contains one side of the parallelogram. That means my parallelogram, the other side is parallel to this. So if I shift that down this way, parallel line is going to be somewhere, somewhere here. And then my other two sides are going to be like this. So that's a sketch of my parallelogram. So it takes a little bit to get that, but it definitely helps uh, to draw a diagram of it so you can see what you're doing. So we want to find the area of this parallelogram. Well, to find the area of a parallelogram, if you can find the area of one of these triangles, all you need to do is multiply it by four because each of these triangles is going to have the same area. So I'm going to work on this one here. Let's call it triangle one. Area of a triangle, I need the three points, the three vertices. If I have the three vertices, then I can move them over. I can make one of them at zero, zero and use my uh, area of a triangle formula. So I'm going to start with uh, this point here. That's the point O. That's the point of intersection of the two diagonals. If I want to find the coordinates of the point O, then it's simultaneous equations with uh, this line here and this line here. So the point O, uh, I'll use the two equations, x minus y uh, minus 7 is equal to 0, so I'll just say it's equal to 7. And x plus y minus 1 is equal to 0, so x plus y is equal to 1. Well, these are easy enough. I can add straight away. I get 2x, I get 0y, and I get 8, so x is equal to 4. So if x is equal to 4, that means uh, 4, um, 4 plus something is equal to 1, so that must be a minus 3. 4 minus 3 is equal to 1, so that means y is equal to minus 3. So my point O is 4 minus 3. I'm going to find this point here then. I'm going to call that OR. So OR is the intersection of this line, uh, x minus 5y minus 7 is equal to 0, and this line, x plus y minus 1 is equal to 0. So point OR uh, that's the intersection of x minus 5y minus 7 is equal to 0, I'll just say equal to equal to 7, and x, uh, which one was it, this one, x plus y is equal to 1. So I think the easiest way for this would be to subtract the x, so subtract that and subtract that, that means the x's would cancel out, I'd get minus 5y minus y is minus 6y, 7 minus 1 is 6, so that means y is equal to minus 1. Well, if y is minus 1, that would be x minus 1 is equal to 1, that would mean x is equal to 2. So that gives me the point or of 2 comma minus 1. So I have two points so far. I have O, I have OR, and let's find this one here, that's P. Well, I don't need to do anything really to find P, because I know P is on the x-axis, and I know it cuts the x-axis at x equal to 7. So P has coordinates of 7, 0. That's from before. So I have my three points. I'll just write them up here. I have P, 7, 0. I have O, which was 4 minus 3. And I have OR, which was 2 minus 1. To find the area of a triangle, when I have the points of the three vertices, what I do is I move one of the points to 0, 0, and then I can use my formula. My formula is uh, area 
is equal to a half times the absolute value of x1, y2 minus x2, y1. But that only works if one of them is 0, 0. So the easiest one to make 0, 0 would be p. If I just take 7 away from the x value of p, then that will move it to 0, 0. I don't need to do anything to the y value. So I'll do that to each of these. I'll take 7 away from the x value. So my point p then becomes uh, p dash, which will be 0, 0. My point O becomes O dash, which will be uh, 4 minus 7 is minus 3. This stays the same, so minus 3 comma minus 3. And then OR becomes OR dash. So 2 minus 7 is minus 5. And then don't need to do anything to the minus 1. So I have my three points here like this. So this would be my x1, y1 and my x2, y2. So area filling in using these points here is a half times the absolute value of minus uh, 5. So just let's say um, x1, y1, x2, y2. So minus 5 times minus 3. Minus x2 is minus 3 times y1, which is minus 1. So that's a half times, that works out to be 12 inside of there. Half times the absolute value of 12, which is 6. So that's just the area of the triangle. Remember, uh, P, O, R. And I said earlier on that the area of the parallelogram will just be four times the area of one of these triangles. So the area of the parallelogram is equal to six times four, which is 24 square units. Okay, so on to question three then, and question three is our circle question. Uh, starts off with part A, the equation of the circle C is x squared plus y squared plus 2x minus 4y minus 20 is equal to 0. Find the center and radius of c. So this is the general equation of a circle. Um, it's x squared plus y squared plus 2gx plus 2fy minus uh, plus c um, equal to 0. So the center which we usually call O, is given by minus G minus F. So if you have the equation in this form here, you half this and change the sign, half this and change the sign. So that's equal to uh, minus 1 and 2. So the center of this circle is minus 1, 2. The radius then uh, we have the formula for it, or is equal to the square root of g squared plus f squared minus c. So that would be the square root of g, which was minus 1, so minus 1 squared plus f, which was 2, so plus 2 squared. Um, the signs actually don't really matter here because we're squaring it you're going to get a positive answer anyway. So it should actually be uh, 1 squared and minus 2 squared. So I'll just put that in 1 squared and minus 2 squared. And then minus c. So c is, is 20. Minus c is minus, minus 20. So that works out to be the square root of 1 plus 4 plus 20. That's equal to root 25. So therefore, or is equal to... 5. Part B. Now part B says uh, two lines L and K intersect at the point 2 minus 2. The distance from the center of the circle C to L and K is 2 root 5. Find the equations of L and K. This is a slightly different take on a very common question. So the common question is um, when you have a circle and you have a point out here 
and that point makes uh, two makes the, so the point of intersection of the two lines and it makes two tangents to the circle so tangential here and here uh, this question is very similar to that um, but instead of the two lines being tangents what's happening here is that the two lines they just go through the circle at some stage but the distance from the center to each line is still equal and it's given to us as 2 root, two root 5 whereas in the normal uh, question that you're probably used to the distance from the center to each uh, line would be equal to the radius in this case it's not in this case they're not tangents so the distance is given as 2 root 5 so this is the type of question where you use the perpendicular distance from a point to a line formula and it's all in terms of m and you solve for the two different m's so we'll start off by writing down uh, the equation of l and k now this will be in terms of uh, of m so the general equation of a line is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1 we have our point um, the point we're going to use is uh, this point here so that's a point on our line so that'll be y uh, minus y1 is y plus 2 is equal to m times x uh, minus 2 so that'll be y plus 2 is equal to m x minus 2m now I'm just going to write it in the form of ax plus by plus c equal to 0 so to get it all into that form get everything to one side and I'll have the leading coefficient uh, positive so that'll be m x minus y minus 2m minus 2 is equal to 0 that's my general equation of both lines l and k now I just need to find what m is and that will give me the equation of both lines. So I'm going to use the perpendicular distance from uh, perpendicular distance from a point to a line. So it's from the center uh, which we found earlier on as minus 1 2. Uh, center O was minus 1 2. And the perpendicular distance to the line is 2 root 5. So for this formula, it's D is equal to the absolute value of AX1 plus BY1 plus C all over the square root of A squared plus B squared. Now, A and B are from this along with C. And x1, y1 is the center here. So that's x1, y1. And over here, I'm just going to write what a, b, and c are. a is the coefficient of x. So in this case, it's m. b is the coefficient of y. So in this case, it's minus 1. And c is the constant, which is minus 2m minus 2. Minus 2m minus 2. Be careful that you do get the signs in there correctly. And d is 2 root 5. So I can fill out this formula and it'll be in terms of m and I'll solve it for m. So d is 2 root 5. That's equal to the absolute value of ax1. So a was m, x1 was minus 1, plus b, which was minus 1, times y1, which was 2, and plus c, which was minus 2m minus 2 and remember it's the absolute value of that all over the square root of a squared plus b squared so a squared that's m squared and b squared is minus 1 squared which is just plus 1 so i have this uh, equation here now there's some square roots in it and there's some absolute values in it and it's in terms of m to solve this I can get rid of the square root, the absolute value, and the square root all in one step by squaring everything. So if I square this side, and if I square this side, squaring the fraction 
is just just has the effect of square in the top and square in the bottom. Um, I should probably tidy up inside uh, in the absolute values first before I go square in it. But I can square this side. So uh, 2 root 5 squared is 2 squared and root 5 squared. So that's 4 by 5. So that's 20 is equal to... I'm just going to tidy this up. I'm not going to square it yet. Uh, when I tidy that up, I get minus 3m minus 4. And that's going to be squared. And then this m squared plus 1, squaring that gives you m squared plus 1. So I need to go and square this top line next. It's the absolute value of minus 3m minus 4. When you square absolute values, it's minus 3m minus 4 squared. So this gets rid of the absolute values for us. Uh, square of minus 3m is 9m squared. Twice the product then, uh, minus by minus is a plus, 3 by 4 is 12. 12m times 2 is 24m. And then... Uh, Square to last is plus 16. So that gives me the top line of 9m squared plus 24m plus 16. So on the next line, it's 20. I'm going to multiply across by this on the bottom. So 20m squared plus 20 is equal to that top line then squared was 9m squared plus 24m plus 16. You can see I have a quadratic equation in terms of m. Get everything to one side. Uh, so that would be 20m squared plus 20 minus 9m squared minus 24m minus 16 is equal to 0. Simplify. That gives me 11m squared minus 24m plus is equal to 0. So let's see if we can factorize this now. Um, so factors of 11m squared are 11m and m. So that's a prime number, so there's no other factors. Factors of mine of 4 then, and I need, uh, need the product then to give me minus 24. It's going to work out at minus 2 and minus 2. We can check that by saying 11m by minus 2 is minus 22m, and then minus 2 by m is minus 2m, so that's minus 24. So it's the product of the outside 2 plus the product of the in inside 2 should give you the middle term there. Uh, and that's equal to 0. So we can let each factor equal to 0 and solve for m. That one ends up giving us m is equal to 2 over 11. And that one gives us m is equal to 2. So I have my two slopes. Remember that m is the slope of, the, of each line that I had. I have the equation of the line in terms of m from up here. So if I sub m into that, I'll get the first equation. And if I, if I sub this m into that, I'll get the second equation. Uh, Another way I could do it is just use um, this formula again, y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. So either way is fine. Um, might actually be easier to, to do this one. So we'll do, we'll do that one. So that's y uh, minus y1. Remember my point is uh, 2 minus 2. So that's y plus 2 is equal to 2 over 11 times x uh, plus or sorry minus x1 x1 was 2 so y x minus 2 uh, and we can simplify that out multiply across by 11 so 11 y plus 22 is equal to 2 x minus 4 um, it doesn't ask us to put it in any particular uh, form so I'll just tidy up by um, by maybe adding 4 to both sides. 11y 
uh, plus 26 is equal to 2x. Uh, that form should be fine. If you want, you could maybe take everything to one side and have 2x minus 11y minus 26 is equal to 0. It doesn't specify what form it wants the equations in, so you can put it in any form you want. That's equation 1. Equation 2 then using m equal to 2, so that would be y plus 2 is equal to 2 times x minus 2. So that's y plus 2 is equal to 2x minus 4. Um, and then just uh, add 4 to both sides to get y plus 6 is equal to 2x. Or you could write it out as 2x minus y minus 6 is equal to 0. But there's my two equations anyway. Um, so that was, a, that was a tough enough question. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of space for it either. I reckon if you got a question like that in, uh, in the Leaving Cert in June, you'll have a lot more space for it. So it'll be a little bit easier for you to, to do out. And then part C, the last part of this question. Uh, given that the measure of the acute angle between the lines L and K is theta, show that sine of theta is 4 over 5. So uh, the angle between two lines, uh, we have a formula for that. It's tan of theta is equal to uh, plus or minus or plus and minus m1 minus m2 over uh, 1 plus m1 times m2. So we just need to know the two slopes and we have them just up above here. So the tan of theta is equal to plus or minus uh, that would be 2 minus 2 over 11 over 1 plus 2 times 2 over 11. That works out to be plus or minus 4 over 3. Uh, now, we're, this is two answers, plus and minus 4 over 3, because we use the unit circle. And if we write in cast in the unit circle, we can see that tan is positive down here and up here. We're told, however, that it's an acute angle. So the acute angle means that it's in the first quadrant here. So tan is, is positive here, it's an acute angle, it's got to be in there. If tan is positive down here, it wouldn't be an acute angle. And the negative ones um, are in here, they're not acute angles either. So tan of theta is equal to positive 4 over 3. I can draw a right angle triangle for this. There's my theta, there's 4, there's 3, it's a right angle. Uh, you should recognize this as the 3, 4, 5 uh, right angle triangle. That's a Pythagorean triple. Um, if you don't recognize that, you can use Pythagoras and solve to get that equal to 5. Now we're just looking for the sine of theta. Well, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So opposite is 4. Hypotenuse is 5, and that's what they asked for. So sine theta is 4 over 5 as required. Okay, so on to question 4. Um, question 4 says a triangle has sides of length A, B, and C. Uh, the angle opposite the side of length A is capital A. Prove that A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos A. Well, this is just the cosine rule proof, which hopefully you will have learned uh, by this stage. So I'll go through it with you now anyway. Um, to prove the cosine rule, what we do is we start by drawing uh, a circle, like so, um, with center at 0, 0. We call that uh, point A. Um, A is 0, 0. We pick another point out here somewhere, we'll call it B. B has coordinates um, C, 0. So we've come out a distance here of C. And then we pick any point 
on the circle like that and we join this point B to it. We're going to call this point big C and we join big C to A as well. So if this is point B, that's angle B and side small b, this will be angle A and this will be side small a and this we already said was side C and this is angle C. Uh, we have coordinates for A and B. We want coordinates for C. Well, if you use, uh, or if you remember back to your unit circle, the coordinates of C would be cos A sine A, but um, we don't have, it's not a unit circle. The radius of this circle is B. So it's actually B cos A comma B sine A. So those are the coordinates of, of C. So a couple of things uh, to write down before, um, before we can start working it out. The length of AC is equal to B. Um, C, the coordinates of C were B cos A and B sine A. Um, the length of BC is equal to A. Now we can use the, the distance between two points formula to actually calculate the length BC. So the, the length BC, which is actually A, is equal to the square root of uh, C minus B cos A, in brackets to be squared, plus 0 minus B sine A, in brackets to be squared. Okay, so that's the the distance between two points formula. Uh, square both sides, I get a squared is equal to c minus b cos a squared. And then I'll take away the zero, it's just minus b sine a squared. And obviously when you square a square root, um, you get the thing underneath. So let's uh, square out these two here. So I get a squared is equal to uh, the square root of first, which is c squared, twice the product, which is minus 2bc cos a. And you might recognize that as part of the cosine rule. And then the square of the last, which will be plus uh, b squared cos squared a. And then squaring this, that's uh, plus b squared sine squared a. Uh, so now I have a common factor here, b squared and b squared. So I'm going to take that out. So coming up here, I get uh, a squared is equal to c squared minus 2bc cos a plus b uh, sorry, small b squared, so that's taken out the common factor here, times, that's times cos squared a plus sine squared a. Um, if you look at your uh, trig identities in your log tables, you'll find that cos squared a plus sine squared a is actually equal to 1. So, I can get rid of this bracket altogether. B squared times one is just B squared. So now I have A squared is equal to C squared minus two B C cos A plus B squared. And then just one more line to tidy it up, put it in the right order. A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared minus two B C cos A as required. Uh, so I suppose in this uh, proof, the thing that you really need to remember uh, is to get your diagram done properly. So I'd, I'd recommend learn this diagram off and then if you're if you're able to work through uh, through your, your formulas then for the distance between two points, you'll be able to get um, you'll be able to get down to this. But this is the most important part of the cosine rule um, proof. 
Okay, let's move on to part B. So part B then says PQR is a triangle uh, and S is a point on PQ. Uh, PR, which is this length here, is equal to RS, which is equal to 5. So I'm going to write in 5 straight away there on that. Uh, PS is equal to 8 and RQ is equal to 10. Find the angle PSR. PSR is this angle here. Find that angle. So to find that angle, I'm going to use the cosine rule because I have three sides and I'm looking for an angle. So the cosine rule is a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus uh, 2bc cos a. And I'm looking for a. So that's 5 squared is equal to 5 squared plus 8 squared minus 2 times 5 times 8 times the cos of a. Uh, square out everything and, and multiply out the brackets. That's 25 is equal to 25 plus 64 minus uh, 2 times 5 times 8 is 80 cos a. Uh, Let's take these over to the other side. 25 minus 25 is 0. Minus 64 is equal to minus 80 cos a. Divide by minus 80 to get minus 64 divided by minus 80 is equal to cos a. Minuses cancel out there. a is equal to the inverse cos of 64 over 80. So A is equal to 36.87 degrees, correct to two decimal places. On to part two, uh, hence find the length SQ. So I'm gonna find the length SQ in here, which is uh, this length here, SQ. So what I'm gonna do for this, is I'm just gonna redraw the diagram so I can see what's going on. So just a rough kind of sketch of it, like this. Um, we have that going down there. That was five, that was five. Um, this was 10. I found this here. That was my answer from before. That was 36.87. So that means this angle here is 180 minus 36.87. That's 143.13. And this is the side I'm looking for. That's SQ. SQ, I'm just going to call it X. Okay, so let's say SQ uh, equal to X. So I can't find X directly. I have an angle and have two sides. But I can use the sine rule to find the other angle. I can use the sine rule here because I have this angle and this side. I have this side and I want this angle. So I can use the sine rule. And I'm looking for an angle. So let's put sine of A on top. So sine A over A is equal to sine B over B. Now I always put the one that I want. Let's call that angle A. In the top left it just makes it much easier to do my calculations so sine a over a which is 5 is equal to sine b so that's going to be my b so sine of 143.13 over b which is 10 so sine a is equal to 5 times sine 143.13 divided by 10. So that gives me uh, sine A is equal to, or A is equal to the sine inverse of that there, 5 sine 143.13 over 10. So A works out at, so straight into your calculator there, and you get A is equal to 17. 0.46 degrees. 
So that gives me this angle here, A. I want this side X. So I could use the sine rule, X over sine of this angle is equal to either of these over the sine of their opposite angle. So I just need to find this angle here. So that angle is going to be uh, 180 minus 17.46 minus uh, my 143.13. So that angle up there, uh, let's call it angle small a, or sorry, that'll be angle, uh, let's call it angle x because it's opposite side x. So angle x is equal to 19.41 degrees. Okay, so I'm nearly there. I'm looking for this side x here. So it's the sine rule again, x over, remember, put the one you want in the top left, x over the sine of the angle x, so sine 19.41 degrees is equal to, you can choose any of them here now, you could either choose 10 or five, I'll go with 10 over the sine of the angle opposite it, which is 143.13. So that means x is equal to 10 times the sine of 19.41 over sine 143.13. And then that gives us x is equal to 5.54 centimeters. So question five is a probability question. Uh, part A says that the probabilities of three candidates, Owen, Killian, and Catherine, passing the driving test on a particular attempt are five over six, three over four, and four over five, respectively. Find the probability that none of the candidates pass the driving test. So that would be the, the probability of failure for all three of them. So let's have a look for um, for own, first of all, well, if the probability of him passing is 5 over 6, the probability of him failing is 1 over 6. For Killian, then, the probability of Killian passing is 3 over 4. So the probability of him failing is 1 over 4. And the probability for Catherine passing is 4 over 5. So the probability of her failing is 1 over 5. So the probability of failure, 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 taking them in that order, is 1 over 6 times 1 over 4 times 1 over 5. And that will be 1 over 20. Part 2 then says, find the probability that Catherine is the only candidate to pass the test. So if we take them in the same order as before, I'm going to say the probability of failure, failure, pass. So that'll be equal to 1 over 6 for Owen times 1 over 4 for Killian times Catherine passing then, which is times 4 over 5. So that'll be 4 over 120, which simplifies to 1 over 30. Part 3 Given that only one of these candidates passes the test, find the probability that um, the person who, who uh, passes is Catherine. So what we need to do is find the probability of each one of them uh, being the only person to pass, first of all. So the probability of, let's say, um, the first person own passing, so pass, fail, fail. That would be 5 over 6 times 1 over 4 times 1 over 5. That's 5 over 120, which is 1 over 24. So that's the probability that uh, Owen would pass. The probability that uh, Killian would pass then, which would be failure, pass, failure, that would be equal to 1 over 6 times 3 over 4 times 1 over 5 which is 3 over 120 or 1 over 40. And then the probability of Catherine passing, we just worked out in the last one, that was 1 over 30. So those are the individual probabilities that 
only one of them will pass. So this is only Owen passing, this is only Killian passing, and this is only Catherine passing. So together, the probability of getting one pass, that would be these three added together. So that's 1 over 24 plus 1 over 40 plus 1 over 30, which is 1 over 10. So that's the probability there that one of them will pass. We're asked, uh, given that one of them passes, so we know one person passes, find the probability that this person is Catherine. This is conditional probability, so it's the probability that Catherine passes given there is a pass. So that's equal to the probability of Catherine passing divided by the probability that one of them passes. So it's 1 over 30 divided by 1 over 10, which is 1 third. Uh, part B then, in a particular year, it was found uh, that on average, three out of five candidates passed their test in a certain driving test centre. A random sample of 10 candidates who take the driving test in the centre is selected. Find the probability that exactly 7 out of 10 of the candidates pass their test. Okay, so the probability of a pass in this test, is, or in this test centre, is 3 over 5. And the probability of a failure is 2 over 5. So this is a Bernoulli trial. There's pass or there's fail. So we want the probability of seven passes. Now, there is a formula that you can use for this. Um, this is the formula here. Um, so it's n choose k times p to the power of k times q to the power of n minus k. Now, I don't actually like using the formula. I just try to work it out logically. So the probability of getting seven passes. Well, if we have seven passes, the probability of a pass is three over five. And we want that to happen seven times. So it's to the power of seven. We also want failure to happen. We want the probability of the failure to happen three times. So this is uh, seven fa passes and three failures. But we need to know how many ways can this happen. So this can happen if there's 10 candidates, it's 10 choose seven. There's that many ways that this combination of things can happen. So that's just working it out logically. It's the exact same as using the formula, but it's working it out in a logical way rather than memorizing a formula and trying to figure out what goes into the formula. So you can type that into your calculator as it is there, and you should get an answer of 0 0.215, correct to three decimal places. Uh, part two then uh, of B. Part two says, find the probability that at least two candidates pass the test and give your answer correct to four decimal places. Well, the probability that at least two pass, so probability at least at uh, least to pass the way to do this is 1 minus the probability of zero passing and the probability of one passing okay. so you could go and figure out the probability of three passing, the probability of four passing, the probability of five passing, etc., all the way up to 10 passing and add them together. But it's quicker to say one minus what doesn't happen. So that would be equal to one minus the probability of zero passes. Well, zero passes would be all failures. So that's two over five. And how many times? 10 times. So all failures plus the probability of one pass. So that would be the pass is three over five. We want it to happen one time. And then the failure is two over five. And we want that to happen nine times. And then how many ways can this happen? Well, that's 10 choose one, which is just 10. So again, that's, that's the same formula from earlier on, but it's just working it out logically. So you can type that into your calculator as it is there, 
one minus that stuff in the brackets. Just be careful to use your brackets, uh, especially because you have this minus outside of this here. Uh, so that is equal to 0 0.9983, correct to four decimal places. Okay, so question six then, which is a geometry question. Uh, part A, uh, A, B, C, D is a square of side five units. B, C is extended to the point E, uh, such that B, E is nine units. Uh, A, E and D, C intersect at the point F. Uh, one, prove that the triangles F, C, E and F, D, A are similar. So F, C, E is this small triangle here and F, D, A is this small triangle up here. So to prove they're similar, we need to prove that the three angles uh, are equal. So the first one is they both have a right angle there. That would be that one. So um, you can say angle F, C, E is equal to the size of the angle F, D, A. Now you need to give a reason and to get full marks. So the reason is that they're both 90 degrees. Uh, number two then, uh, we're going to say that uh, this one, EFC, is equal to AFD. And why is that? That's because they're vertically opposite. So the angle EFC is equal to the size of the angle AFD. And remember, you have to give your reason. The reason is that they're vertically opposite. And then the third one then is that this angle here is equal to this angle here. And so that would be angle CEF is equal to angle DAF. There's two reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is that you could say it's the remaining angle in the triangle and they must add up to 180. So uh, therefore they're equal. Or you can say that uh, they are alternate angles, um, which is the one that I'm going to go for, alternate angles, because we know that this line and this line is parallel because it's a square. Uh, part two is find the length of FC and give your answer in the form of A over B. So FC is this side here. So I want to find that side, let's call it X. I'm going to add in some other things that I know about everything here. So it's a square of length five. So I'm going to add in all my fives there. I know that BE is nine, so that leaves that being four. And if DC is five, and this is X, that leaves me with five minus X. So given that these two triangles are similar, I, I know that the ratios of their sides um, are equal to each other. So I can say the length of this side over this side is equal to the length of this side over this side. So that gives me, um, I'll just write it out for you which sides it is. So it's FC over FD is equal to CE over AD. So it's this one over this one. So it's the one between the right angle and the single dot, right angle, single dot. So this over this is equal to this over this. So that's right angle and double dot, right angle and double dot. So filling it in, it's X over X minus five. Um, sorry, that's five, five minus X, not X minus five. Five minus X is equal to four over five. Simplify this, then multiply across by 5 minus x times 5 to get 5x equal to 4 times 5 minus x. So that's 5x is equal to 20 minus 4x. Uh, take 4x, add 4x to both sides, 9x equals 20. So x is equal to 20 over 9.
uh, part three then, hence find the area of the quadrilateral, uh, A, B, C, F, um, and give your answer in the form of A, B. So that's the quadr A, B, C, F is this quadrilateral. Well, basically it's the square minus this triangle. So I'm gonna say the area is equal to the square. It's the square of five. So that's 25 minus the triangle. So my triangle is of course a half times the base times the perpendicular height. So that's a half, let's say the base is five and the perpendicular height then is five minus x. So that's five minus 20 over nine. So five minus 20 over nine. And that works out to be 125 over 18. So that's the area of the triangle. So my area then of my quadrilateral is 25 minus that um, 125 over 18, uh, which works out to be 325 over 18. And just be careful, it does say in the form of A over B, so don't write it as a whole number with, uh, with a fraction remainder. On to part B then, the triangle POQ is a right angled at zero and OR is perpendicular to PQ as shown. Um, PO is 14, so that's this side here, and OQ is 48, that's that side there. Uh, find the length OR, which is this one here, find that one, X. So to find this one here, um, basically I have similar triangles. I have this big triangle here is similar to this small triangle here. The way I can say that is I have a right angle in both of them. They share this angle here, that's common. So therefore the third angle must be equal as well. So that means they're similar triangles. So I can use my ratios again uh, and I can say that one, maybe this, over this is equal to this over this. So I just need to find this side PQ. So PQ using Pythagoras is just equal to the square root of 14 squared plus 48 squared. Uh, that works out to be 50. So the length here PQ is 50. Then I can use my similar triangles. So what I'm gonna do is O or over P O is equal to O Q over P Q. So that's O or, which is this side, the side I want X over P O, which is this side here of that triangle, the big triangle is equal to O Q, that side there over P Q that side there. So O or is X, P O is 14, O Q is 48 and P Q is 50. So then X is equal to 14 times 48 over 50, which works out to be 13.44 centimeters. Part two then, uh, taking O as the origin, find the equation of the circle that passes through O, OR and Q. So just to give a little sketch of this, the a circle passes through O, OR and Q. That means it has some sort of uh, arc coming, going through all these three, um, these three points there like that. Now, if I have a chord like this going from one point on the circumference to another point on the circumference and the third angle the angle that's subtended on the on the circle is a right angle then that means that this chord is actually a diameter so that gives us the diameter of the circle being 48 which means the center of the circle is here which is 24 units away so that is the point 24 0 
So I can find straight away the center of the circle. So the center is equal to 24, 0. And the radius, well, the radius, if this is the origin and this is the center, then we've come 24 units from the center to the from the uh, center to the origin. So that means the radius is 24. So R is equal to 24. So now we can just use the equation of a circle. So the equation of the circle uh, from your log tables is X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared is equal to R squared. Fill in what we have. So X minus 24 squared plus y minus zero squared is equal to four, uh, 24, was it 24 squared? Um, squaring these out and simplifying it all down, um, you end up getting x squared plus y squared minus 48x is equal to zero. So that would, that would be your final answer here. Um, just working through, squaring out this bracket, um, y minus 0 is y, so that's just y squared. Squaring out that, simplifying it up as much as you can, you end up with x squared plus y squared minus 48 equal to 0. Okay, so on to part B, and this is question 7. So uh, a wind turbine used to generate electricity has three equally spaced blades of equal length as shown. When the wind turbine is operating, the blades rotate at a constant speed. Uh, the tips of the blades are painted in different co colors to distinguish them from each other uh, for maintenance and quality control. The tip of one blade is painted red and the height of this tip above ground level in meters can be modeled using the function h of t is equal to 65 plus 36 sine 3 over 2t minus 15 cosine 3 over 2t where t is the time in seconds and 3 over 2t is expressed in radians. Part A, find the height of the tip of the blade above the ground when t is e equal to zero. Um, so for this, we don't actually know where it's starting. Um, it's not necessary that the, the tip of the blade is at the bottom or at the top. It's just at time zero. So we're going to go and find the h of zero. So that's subbing in zero instead of t. So that'll be 65 plus 36 sine uh, 3 over 2 times 0 is 0, minus 15 cosine 3 over 2 times 0 is 0. So you can type that into your calculator there as it is. Just remember that we are in radians and you get 50 meters. Uh, part 2 then says, uh, find the times in the first revolution uh, when the tip of the blade is exactly 65 meters above ground level uh, and give your answer in seconds correct to three decimal places so it says times because we'll say if for example this was 65 meters it would be at 65 meters when the blade is there as well so you get two answers for it so find the times uh, when the tip of the blade is exactly 65 meters so that means the h of t is equal to 65 so the function is equal to 65 so we say 65 is equal to uh, our function here h of t so that's 65 is equal to 65 plus 36 sine 3 over 2 t minus 15 cos 3 over 2 t so straight away we can see that the 65 and 65, you can take 65 from both sides. And then we can maybe add this to both sides to get 15 cos uh, 3 over 2t is equal to 36 sine, uh, sine 3 over 2t. Then we can divide both sides by 36 and at the same time divide both sides by cosine 3 over 2t. That will give us 15 over 36 is equal to sine uh, 3 over 2t over cosine 3 over 2t. 
remember we're trying to solve for t here to see what t is. So sine over cosine you should know is equal to tan. So that's tan of 3 over 2t is equal to 15 over 36. Now if I want to find uh, 3 over 2t, so that would be the tan inverse of 15 over 36 will give me 3 over 2t. Uh, the tan inverse of uh, 15 over 36 is 0 0.394791. So that's equal to 3 over 2t. So that works out, uh, t is equal to uh, this divided by this, or this multiplied by 2 over 3, whichever way you want to solve for yourself. You end up getting t is equal to 0 0.263 seconds. So remember that we are asked for the times, okay? So find uh, the times, plural. So if we go to our unit circle um, and we look at cast, we are looking for when is tan positive. So we know that tan is positive in the first quadrant and in the third quadrant. So this one here is the first quadrant. Uh, to get it in the third quadrant, it's gonna be uh, it's going to be this plus pi. So pi plus our 0 0.39. So let's say 3 over 2 uh, t is equal to 0 0.3941791 uh, plus pi. And that will bring us around into the fourth quadrant. So then t is equal to... Um, this divided by 3 over 2, so 0 0.394179 plus pi divided by 3 over 2. And that ends up working out as t is equal to 2.358 seconds. Hence or otherwise, find the time for each blade to complete one revolution. So time um, for one revolution, well if we just look at um, the, two, the two times that we had um, from before, we had kind of this angle here and this angle here, they're 180 degrees or pi radians away from each other. So if we find the difference between these two and then multiply by two, that will be uh, our time. So our time is two times the difference between these two angles. So 2.358 minus 0 0.263. And that works out to be 4.19 seconds. Uh, part four then, we're looking for the angular speed of the blades in radians per second, uh, correct to one decimal place. Well, angular speed, um, angular speed is equal to the revol time for one revolution. So revolution divided by time. So one revolution is two pi, and time for one revolution is 4.19 seconds so that works out to be 1.5 radians per second part b then using calculus find the maximum uh, height and the minimum height above the ground level of the tip of the blade in each revolution so using calculus is a strong hint for differentiation here and maximum and minimum, uh, that's going to be differentiating and letting the derivative equal to zero and then solving for, uh, for t and then subbing t back into the original function to find the, the maximum and minimum heights. So I'll write down my h of t. My h of t was 65 plus 36 sine 3 over 2t minus 15 cosine 3 over 2t. 
So I'm going to differentiate. So at a h dash of t is equal to um, 65, derivative of 65 is 0, uh, plus, now when I differentiate sine, I get cosine. So it's the cosine of 3 over 2t times my 36, and also times the derivative of this, which is 3 over 2. So it's 3 over 2 times 36 cosine of the angle. Similar over here, when I differentiate cosine, I get minus sine. I have a minus, so it's going to be plus. Minus by minus is a plus. It's going to be sine of the angle, 3 over 2t, times my 15, and times the derivative of 3 over 2t, which again is 3 over 2. And remember, when we're doing max min problems, we let the derivative equal to zero. So that's equal to zero, and we're going to solve for t. So the first thing I, that I notice here is that I have a common factor of 3 over 2. So I can divide across by 3 over 2, and that gets rid of them straight away. Dividing this by 3 over 2, dividing this by 3 over 2, and dividing 0 by 3 over 2, which is just 0. So that gives me 36 cos... 3 over 2t plus 15 sine 3 over 2t equals 0. So I can now do, this is kind of similar to the, the question from before. I'm going to bring this one to the other side to get 36 cos 3 over 2t is equal to minus 15 sine 3 over 2t. So like the last time, I'm going to divide both sides by 15 and divide both sides by cosine 3 over 2t. That's going to give me minus 36 over 15 is equal to sine 3 over 2t over cosine 3 over 2t. You can see that this in this exam paper, this was a, a common technique to use. I think this is actually the third time in, in this uh, exam between paper one and paper two that I'm using this kind of skill here of changing something that looks like this into tan because sine over cosine is tan. So that gives me the tan of 3 over 2t is equal to minus 36 over 15. So the tan inverse of minus 36 over 15 is equal to 3 over 2t. So that means 3 over 2t is equal to 1.176. Uh, so sticking that into your calculator, you get 1.176. And I'm going to have to go to my unit circle again. So unit circle, cast. I'm looking for the times when tan is negative. Well, tan is positive here and positive here. So it's negative here in the third or second quadrant and in the fourth quadrant. So in the second quadrant, it's pi minus my reference angle that I just got here. So 3 over 2t is equal to pi minus the 1.176 and in the fourth quadrant it's 360 minus so 2 pi minus my reference angle so 3 over 2t is equal to 2 pi minus 1.176 so I'll just solve through these to find t. So t would be this divided by 3 over 2. t is then equal to 1.310. And on this one, you get t is equal to 3.404. And then I found my t's to find the maximum height. Then you sub the t back into the original function to find the maximum height. So it's the h of 1.310 uh, is equal to, you sub it all in, and 
pop it into your calculator. I'm subbing into this here. Uh, so sub uh, 1.310 in instead of T here and here. And that should work out to give you 104 meters for that one. That'll be the maximum height uh, when it's um, the maximum height, sorry, at, the, at, the, at its highest point. And this one then, um, when you get the H of 3.404, it ends up being 26 meters. So that's going to be the minimum height. Part two, hence find the length of each blade. Well, the length of each blade would be the difference between the highest point, if we have a, a circle here, and that's its highest point, and that's its lowest point. The length of a blade would be half the distance between them. So the distance between them would be 104 minus 26, and we get half of that. So that would be 39 meters. Uh, over the page then to part three. Find the distance traced out by the tip of the blade in one full revolution and give your answer in terms of pi. So the distance traced out by the tip of the blade will just be equal to one circumference because the, the tip of the blade just goes around in a circle. So it'll be one circumference. Uh, circumference is equal to 2 pi or. So that C is equal to 2 pi times 39. So C is equal to 78 pi. It wants it in terms of pi, so I'll leave it there like that. Uh, part 4 then, using your answer to A part 3, that's this one here, or otherwise, find the speed of the blades in meters per second. Give your answer correct to one decimal place. Now, the wording of this uh, question is a little bit ambiguous. What they actually mean is find the speed of the tip of the blade. Okay, and I suppose the hint there is using your answer to this. So this one, that's the, the, the uh, distance traced out by the tip of the blade. It actually says that in that question. So they want the speed of the tip because, of course, the tip of the blade is traveling at a faster speed uh, in meters per second than, say, a point nearer to the center. So speed is equal to distance divided by time. So the distance uh, from part uh, three before is 78 pi. The time, we actually found that earlier on, time for one revolution was 4.19 seconds. So that works out to be 58.5 meters per second. And then part C. Uh, part C says the expression for h of t can also be written in the form k sine 3 over 2t minus alpha plus 65. Find the value of k and the value of alpha and hence explain what k represents in the context of the question. So if the function can be written like this, then I can start by saying this form of the function is equal to the other form of the function. So that would be k sine uh, 3 over 2t uh, minus alpha plus 65. So that's the, the new form of it, is equal to the old form, which was 65 plus 36 sine 3 over 2t minus 15 cosine 3 over 2t. So for this one, um, this first thing I suppose is that 65 on each side can cancel out just to make it a little bit easier. But what you need to notice here is sine a minus b. That's one of our trigonometric identities. So sine of a minus b is equal to sine a cos b minus cos a sine b. That's one of your trigonometric identities from your log tables. So we can write this side out in this form here. 
So we're rewriting k sine 3 over 2t minus alpha in this form here. So k sine 3 over 2t minus alpha is equal to, we can just leave the, leave the k uh, with out, out in front here because it's, it's k times this. So k times sine a, so that's sine 3 over 2t cos b cos alpha minus cos a cos 3 over 2t sine b sine alpha so multiplying in by the k you get k times sine uh, 3 over 2t cos alpha minus k uh, cos 3 over 2t sine alpha. So that's basically this side here rewritten. I'm going to let it equal to then the that side there. That's 36 sine 3 over 2t minus 15 cos 3 over 2t. Okay, so now we're going to actually equate these. So we have an equation here. We have something with sine 3 over 2t. We have something with sine 3 over 2t. So I'm going to say that this bit is equal to this bit, uh, as far as here. And then this bit here is equal to this bit here. So k sine 3 over 2t cos alpha is equal to 36 sine 3 over 2t. So I have something common to both sides. So three over sine 3 over 2t is common to both sides. So I can divide both sides by uh, sine 3 over 2t. That leaves me with k cos alpha is equal to 36. And then over here uh, for this one, it's minus minus k cos um, 3 over 2t sine alpha is equal to minus 15 cos 3 over 2t. And I can do something similar with that. I have a common factor of cos 3 over 2t. I also have a minus, which is common. So I can divide across by minus 1 and by cos 3 over 2t to get k sine alpha is equal to 15. So I have two new equations here. Um, and what I can do is I can combine these. So the left-hand side divided by the left-hand side is equal to uh, the right-hand side divided by the right-hand side. Or the right hand, uh, the left hand side here divided by the left hand side here is equal to the right hand side divided by the right hand side. So that would be uh, k sine alpha over k cos alpha is equal to 15 over 36. Well, I have k over k here, so they cancel out. And again, and this is the fourth time we get something like this happening in this exam, sine alpha over cosine alpha is tan alpha is equal to 15 over 36. So if tan alpha is 15 over 36, the tan inverse of 15 over 36 is equal to alpha. So alpha is equal to uh, 0 0.39479. So that's alpha found. I now want to find um, k, so I can use this one here. I have k sine alpha is 15. So if I knew what sine alpha was, then I, I'd be able to solve for k. Well, I can use this uh, method that I used earlier on in, in this exam. I have this sine alpha, and the tan of alpha 
is 15 over 36. Tan is opposite over adjacent, so that's 15 here and 36 here. Um, sorry, I. 15 over 30, tan, tan alpha is 15 over 36. That simplifies down to be 5 over 12. Um, so that's just simpler form. Um, so this would be 5 over uh, 5 and 12 rather than uh, 15 and 36. It would actually work for with 15 and 36 as well. But 5 and 12, you should hopefully recognize that as a Pythagorean triple, 5, 12 and 13. If you don't recognize it, you can just use Pythagoras to find the hypotenuse being 13. So that means the sine of alpha, sine is um, opposite over hypotenuse, so sine of alpha is 5 over 13. So that gives me from this here, k times the sine of alpha, so the sine of alpha is 5 over 13 is equal to 15. So then k is equal to 15 divided by 5 over 13, which is equal to 39. And to give an explanation of what k means, well, k, we figured out earlier on, was the length of the blade. So k, in this case, must be the length of blade. So that was a, a long question, a question that had some uh, tricky parts in it and some easy parts in it as well. So if you're a little bit confused, have another look over that section. And if you have any questions, just make sure you ask in the comments below and I'll try my best to answer them for you. Okay, so question eight. Um, a lightning company uh, or a lighting company uh, rather produces several designs of light shades. Uh, one design is the shape of a pyramid with an open square uh, base upside 40 centimeters and a vertical height of 21 centimeters. Uh, sketch the net of the pyramid. No dimensions are required. So the net of the pyramid would just be, say, a square um, like that. And then the pyramid shape itself would be a bigger square around the smaller square like this so no dimensions required all you needed to do was draw a sketch of the net like so part two find the slant height of the pyramid and hence the length of the other sides of the triangular surfaces of the pyramid uh, give your answer in centimeters correct to two decimal places so the slant height of the spear of the of the pyramid would be drawing if we draw one side of the pyramid like this uh, the slant height is this height here l so this is kind of like a side on view where we have the height the the height that they gave us before was 21 and the width or yeah, the, the size of the square was 40, so we could split that up into two 20s and get this right angle triangle here uh, with sides 20, 21, and L, which is the slant height. So L is equal to the square root of 21 squared plus 20 squared. So L works out to be 29. So now they want to find, they want us to find the, the length of the other sides of the triangular surface of the pyramid. So if we look at it from this size, or at this side here, so if we say that this triangle here, this is the height. So this is looking at one of the one of the sides of the triangle or of the lampshade itself. We have again the base is 40. Now this side here this is the slant height, which is 29. And this is the side of the, of the lampshade that we want, x. So I can take that triangle there, one of them out like that. I have x, I have 20, and I have 29. So I can use Pythagoras again. x is equal to the square root of 20 squared plus 29 squared. 
x works out to be 35.23 centimeters. Uh, part three then, hence find the total surface area of the triangular surfaces of the pyramid. So the area, the total surface area, well, it's four triangles. So it's four times a half times the base times the perpendicular height. So that's equal to four times a half. Uh, the base is 40 and the perpendicular height then was 29. So that works out to be 2,320 square centimeters. So four triangles, uh, the area of a triangle is a half times the base, the base was 40 across, and then this is the height um, from the base to the center of the tip, so kind of the height of the actual material of the triangle. So on to the next question, uh, this is part B. So part B says the lighting company also produces cone shaped lights. Um, the diagram, which is not the scale, shows the net of the outer surface of one of these light shades. The vertical height of the light shade is 16 centimeters and the diameter is 60 centimeters as shown. Part one is find the curved surface area of the light shade in terms of pi. So the curved surface area is equal to pi or L. So we need to find this length L here. So uh, I can draw a right angle triangle. I'm told that uh, the diameter is 60, so that means the radius is 30, and I'm told that the height is the vertical height is 16 so this is my l my um my slope height i suppose uh, or my slope length so i can find l l is equal to the square root of 16 squared plus 30 squared so l is equal to 34. so that means pi or l that's uh, the curved surface area equal to pi times the radius which is 30 times the length which is 34 and they want it in terms of pi so that's just 30 times 34 is 1020 and pi so the answer is 1020 pi square centimeters uh, part two to make the light shade a sector is removed uh, from a circular disc of the material used. Uh, find the angle alpha, the measure of the angle at the center of the sector removed and give your answer correct to the nearest degree. So here's the, the diagram for us here. This is what they mean. This sector here with size, angle size alpha is removed and then they fold this around to get the light shade. So the area of a circle or the area of a disc the area of the disc is pi r squared so that's equal to pi times 34 squared uh, which is 1156 pi now the area of a sector of this circle or of this disc is pi r squared times size of the angle over 360. So the angle alpha is um, the angle that we're removing. So the angle that we're removing is 1156 pi. That's the area of the full disc minus the area that we are keeping, which we found in the last section, the curved surface area. So the area that we're keeping is 1020 pi. So th that area is then equal to 136 pi. So that's this here. The area of the sector that we're removing is equal to 136 pi. So that gives us a little equation here. Uh, we know what OR is, so we can solve for alpha. First thing is that the pi's can cancel off. 
So I can write this equation now as uh, r squared times alpha over 360 is equal to 130, uh, 136. Uh, or was 34, so that's 34 squared times alpha over 360 is equal to 136. So divide across by 34 squared, alpha over 360 is equal to 136 over 34 squared. So then multiply across by 360, alpha is 360 times 136 over 34 squared. And if you work that out, you get alpha is equal to 42 degrees. So that's the angle of the sector that they remove is 42 degrees. Part C then says an alternative design of the cone shaped light involves interchanging the radius and the vertical height of the light shade in part B. So instead of having a radius of 30 and a height of 16, we now have a radius of 16 and a height of 30. Find alpha, um, the measure of the angle of the center of the sector removed in this case. So for this question, this part C is actually the same as part B, one and two. It's just condensed into one uh, question. So the first part is to find my L. So just doing the same as before to find my L. This time my radius is 16. My height is 30, so L is equal to the square root of 16 plus 16 squared plus 30 squared. It's actually the same as before. It works out as 34. So doing the same as before, the curved surface area is equal to pi or L. This time it's pi times 16 for the radius and times 34 for the length. So the curved surface area is equal to 544 pi. That's the first half of the question. And um, the second half then is just doing the same as here. So the area of the disc, the area of the disc is equal to pi r squared. So that's equal to uh, pi times 16 squared, so that's 1156 pi squared. Uh, sorry, so that's it's not uh, 16 squared, it's actually uh, pi times 32 squared. So just to explain what's happening there, we're still using the same disc, and um, it still has a radius of 34 uh, centimeters, but it has a different angle. So what's going to happen is when we fold it around like this to make our lampshade, it's going to end up uh, being a lot taller and actually a lot taller and a lot narrower, but it's still cut out of the same size disc. So the, the area of the disc is the same. It's pi r squared um, and r being 34. The area of the sector then, uh, the area of the sector is pi or squared times alpha over 360 and we're going to find this alpha um, the same as the last time uh, this sector that's removed again is 1156 pi minus what we uh, found before which is 544 pi 544 pi which is 612 pi. So the area of the sector that's removed is 612. So we can write this equation up here. Uh, pi or squared times alpha over 360 is equal to 612 pi. So same as the last, last uh, section, uh, cancel out the pi's. Uh, or is 34 again. Uh, and if you remember the order from the last time, uh, alpha was 360 uh, over 34 squared times 
um, the 612. Okay, so it was uh, just the same as, as the one before. So 360 times 136 over 34 squared. Um, so 360, it actually doesn't matter where you put it. Um, 34 squared, you get the same same answer either way. Um, so alpha is equal to 191 degrees. Okay, so on to the next part then. Uh, to make this design, one option is to cut out the sectors required from circular discs uh, produced from rectangular sheets of the material. Uh, find the area of the smallest pop possible sheet of material required and hence find the percentage waste in using this option. So the smallest, um, the smallest sheet um, used would just be a square around the circle so if we're cutting out a disc from from um if we're cutting out a disc then you can get a square around it the square will have sides of two times the radius like that um the radius is 34 so the area of the square is two times 34 squared uh, which is 4624 uh, square centimeters so that's the area of the square so how much is used out of that well we are going to use an angle of theta now each um, each lampshade or light shade requires 169 degrees we could actually fit two of them into a full circle and cut out 338 degrees so we can get two of them in, in one. So that would be, say, one like that, and then one like that. So you get two out of the one, uh, the one circle. So the curved surface area of that, the curved surface area of one of the lampshades was 544 pi. We're going to have two of them, so that's, 1088 pi which works out as 3418 um, square centimeters so the percentage waste that would be the total used so it's 4624 minus um, how much we actually use so that's 3,418. So that's the, the amount of waste uh, that there is on the top divided by the total amount of the square divided by 4,624. So that's equal to 0 0.2608, which is approximately equal to 26.08%. Part three says a second option is to cut uh, the sector required directly from a rectangular sheet of material uh, like the diagram shown find the smallest possible sheet of uh, material required and hence show which option is more efficient so this is one lampshade worth so this angle here beta we found before that's 169 degrees so this angle here let's call it alpha alpha is equal to 11 degrees so I want to find out uh, the size of this. Well, I know that the radius uh, was 34. This height is going to be the same as a radius up like that. So that's also 34. And then I have this length here, X, which isn't quite the same as a radius because this radius would come down to about here. So it's a little bit less than radius, but I should be able to figure out what this side X is. So I can take this right angle triangle like this and I have uh, my 34, I have my X and I have my alpha, which is 11 degrees. So I should be able to find X from this. So I can use the cosine of alpha is equal to uh, X over 34. So X is equal to 34 cosine of alpha alpha was 11 so that means x 
is equal to 33.375. So that's x there, 33.375. So that gives me a rectangle like this with a side of 34 and a side here of 34 plus 33.375, which is uh, 67, 67.375. So the area of that is 34 times 67.375. That's equal to 2290.75. The area of my sector, so the area of my sector, the same as before, was 544 pi which is 1709. So how much waste is there? The percentage waste is equal to 2290.75 minus my 1709 divided by 2290.75. That gives me 0 0.2539 which is approximately equal to 25.39%. So that means 25% uh, waste, 26% waste. So therefore, the second option is more uh, efficient. So second option is more efficient. Okay, and so on to the last question, question nine. So in a large health clinic, uh, the waiting times for a patient to be seen by a doctor are normally distributed with a mean of 34 minutes and a standard deviation of eight minutes. Uh, find the probability that a patient will wait between 30 and 40 minutes before being seen by a doctor. So, we are looking for uh, the probability that uh, our x, the time, will be greater than or equal to uh, 30, but less than or equal to 40. So basically, we're going to use our z scores to calculate this. Okay, so um, your z scores, the formula to find your z score is z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. Uh, we know mu or mean is 34 and sigma or standard deviation is 8. So the probability, uh, let's get the z score first for 30. So the z of 30 is going to be x is 30 minus the mean, which is 34, over the standard deviation, which is 8. And that's equal to minus 0 0.5. The Z score then for 40 is 40 minus 34 divided by 8, which is 0 0.75. So basically we're looking for uh, the probability now that our Z is uh, greater than minus 0 0.5, but less than 0 0.75. Well, we can't uh, find the z, z score of a negative number, so um, th that's not in the in the in the log tables. So we're actually going to find the probability that z is less than zero point seven five. That's this part here, and it, we're going to take away the, the opposite of this one. I suppose it's one minus the probability that z is less than zero point five rather than greater than minus 0 0.5. So you get these from your log tables. Uh, that is the Z score here will give you a probability of 0 0.7734 when you look up 0 0.75. And then that's going to be minus 1 minus when you look up 0 0.5, you get 0 0.6915. So that gives us 0 0.4649. So that's the probability that the uh, patient will wait
between 30 and 40 minutes. Uh, find the upper quartile of waiting times for patients to be seen by a doctor. So the upper quartile is um, above 75%. So we want the probability uh, that Z is less than or equal to K to be equal to 0 0.75. So you look up se uh, 0 0.75 um, in your tables and you'll get Z is equal to 0 0.675. So that is our Z score. So now we can use the formula for it. Z is equal to our X minus our mu over sigma. Uh, fill in Z 0 0.675 is equal to X. Now this is K that I'm looking for. K uh, minus 34, which is our mean over standard deviation, which is eight and we work that out and solve for k, you'll get k is equal to 39.4 minutes. So the upper quartile for waiting times uh, to be seen by a doctor is uh, 39.4 minutes. The director of the health clinic uh, wanted to check whether these waiting times are accurate. She randomly selects 100 patients that visit the clinic and recorded the times that they had to wait to be seen by a doctor. She found that the waiting times of these patients were normally distributed with a mean of 35.7 minutes and the same standard deviation. Test the hypothesis at the 5% level of significance that the mean waiting time for patients to be seen by a doctor has not changed. State the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis Give your conclusion in the context of the question. So the null hypothesis for this H0 would be that our mean is equal to 34, which is which means that the mean has not changed. That's the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis then H1 would be that our mean is not equal to 34. And that is that the mean has changed. Okay, so we want to test this at the 95% level of significance, or sorry, at the 5% uh, level of, of significance. So what we're going to do is write down our X bar, which is 35.7. So that's the, the, lev the mean that she found. Uh, our standard deviation was still eight, it's the same standard deviation, and our n, our sample size, was 100. So if we want to test at the 5% level of significance, what we do is we find the 95% confidence interval. So the 95% confidence interval. So the confidence interval then, we have a formula for it. The formula is uh, x bar minus 1.96 times sigma over root n and x bar plus 1.96 sigma over root n. So we have x bar, we have sigma, we have n. So this is a, an interval there, so we put it in, in our brackets like that. So filling in what we know, uh, 35.7 minus 1.96 times uh, 8 over root 100, comma 35.7 plus 1.96 times 8 over root 100. Uh, so if you work that out, work them out separately, we'll get a confidence interval of 34.132 and 37.268. So that is our confidence interval. So that means our mean, our mu, is 
greater than uh, 34.132 and less than 37.268 and this is our 95% confidence interval so we are 95% confident that the mean lies between these two values that's what the confidence in interval means so the mean uh, that was found before was 34 minutes 34 is outside of this interval so 34 is outside of the interval interval so that means we are 95% sure that the mean has changed has changed which means we reject the null hypothesis we reject h0 h0 was that the mean has not changed so we're rejecting that and we accept h1 so what does this mean in terms of the question well i'll just show you the conclusion from the marking scheme here um so the 95 percent confidence uh, that the mean waiting time in this sample of patients lies in the range of 34.12 to 37.268 so the conclusion is that as 34 is outside the interval uh, for the mean waiting time in this sample of patients we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis i.e we can conclude that there is sufficient evidence to, to suggest that the mean waiting time has changed okay so let's go on to the next part which is b part two so find the p-value of the test performed in b part one above and explain what this value represents in the context of the question so to find our p-value what we do is we get our z is equal to x bar minus mu over sigma over root n x bar in this case was 35.7 our mu was 34, our sigma was 8, and our n is 100. So we fill all these in, that's 35.7 minus 34 over 8 over root 100, which works out to be 2.13. So to, to find our, our p-value then, that is p, the probability that z is greater than 2.13. Or alternatively, we can say that's 1 minus the probability that z is less than 2.13. Because remember, z tables can only give us less than a value. So that's equal to 1 minus you look up our z score here you get 0 0.9834 so that's equal to 0 0.1 0 0.0166 so our p-value then is twice this so p is equal to uh, p-value our p-value is equal to 2 multiplied by 0 0.0166 which is equal to 0 0.0332 and then we will say that 0 0.0332 is less than our 0 0.05 or 5% confidence interval so to give an explanation for this one again I'm just going to refer to the marking scheme so here's the explanation that they're looking for um, so we say we reject the null hypothesis H0 at the 5% level of significance and the explanation is that the p-value is the probability that the test statistic or a more extreme value could occur if the null hypothesis is true. If the mean waiting time is correct, 34 minutes, 
then there's a 3.32% chance, that's what we have here, that finding a mean of 35.7 minutes. So there's a 3% a chance that you'd get a mean of 35.7. And because this has less than a 5% chance, we reject the null hypothesis. Or another way of saying it is, there's a 3.32% chance of finding a mean waiting time of 35.7 minutes if the null hypothesis is correct. So this is your explanation uh, to contextualize the question. On to part C then. So part C says, the director of the health clinic wants to reduce waiting times so that at least 95% of patients are seen by a doctor within 45 minutes. Research has found that employing more doctors will leave the mean waiting time unchanged at 34 minutes, but that the standard deviation will reduce by 0 0.4 minutes for each additional doctor. How many additional doctors are required to reach this target? So what we do here is we get the probability that uh, Z is less than or equal to K, and that is equal to 0 0.95. Well, if we go and look up our Z tables, so we find that Z when at 0 0.95 is equal to 1.645. So that's our Z score. We're going to fill that into our formula. We need our X, which in this case is going to be 45 minutes. Um, our average then is 34. That's unchanged. And the standard deviation, that's equal to 8 minus 0 0.4 for every extra doctor. So we'll sub this into our, our Z-score formula. So 1.645 is equal to 45 minus 34 over 8 minus 0 0.4 N. So... Multiply across by 8, point, 8 minus 0 0.4 n, so 8 minus 0 0.4 n times 1.645 is equal to 45 minus 34, which is 11. So 8 minus 0 0.4 n is equal to 11 divided by 1.645 uh, minus 0 0.4 n is then 11 over 1.645 minus 8. So then n is equal to 11 over 1.645 minus 8, all divided by minus 0 0.4. So we get n is equal to 3.28. So in order to get uh, in order to get 95% of patients seen within 45 minutes, we need 3.28 doctors, which means we need four extra doctors. Because if we had, if we had uh, three, if we rounded down to three extra doctors, we wouldn't reach this target. So we need to get it to four extra doctors to reach the target. Okay, so, and on to, the last part then, the last question of this exam, part D, was taking the random sample in part B, the director uh, also recorded the age of the patients. On further analysis, she, sa she found that the proportion of patients in the sample aged over, over 60 years or more. She also found the largest value of the radius of the 95% confidence interval for this population proportion was 9.408%. Find the smallest number and the largest number of patients in the sample who could be aged 60 years or more. Okay, so for our radius, what we're doing is uh, we have our formula here for Z times the square root of P hat minus, or times one minus P hat over n and that's equal to this as a as a decimal 0 0.09408 now we do know um 
we know some things in here. We know that Z is 1.96. We don't know what P hat is. That's what we're looking for uh, times 1 minus P hat. We know that N is 100, and that's equal to 0 0.09408. So this is my equation, and basically I'm going to work through this and solve for P hat. So let's uh, divide both sides by 1.96. So that gives me P hat times 1 minus P hat over 100 is equal to 0 0.09408 divided by 1.96. I'm going to square both sides to get rid of the square root sign. So on the left, I get p hat times 1 minus p hat over 100. And on the right hand side, when I divide that by 1.96 and then square it, I end up getting 0 0.002304. I'm going to multiply across by 100 to get p hat times 1 minus p hat is equal to 0 0.2304. Multiply out the brackets then, you get p hat minus p hat squared. I'm going to take this over to the opposite side, minus 0 0.2304 is equal to 0. Now we basically have a quadratic equation. So I'm going to multiply across by minus 1 to make the leading coefficient um, positive. So that'll give me p hat squared minus p plus 0 0.2304 is equal to 0. So I just need to solve now for p hat. I'll get two values and that will be my... Um, largest number of patients and the smallest number of patients so it's a quadratic and it's awkward there i'm gonna to have to use the minus b formula so minus b plus and minus um the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a so a is 1 b is minus 1 and c is 0 0.2304 so minus minus 1 is plus 1 plus and minus the square root of 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times 0 0.2304. And that's over 2 times 1. So if you work through that and find your two values, which are your plus and minus, you end up getting p hat is equal to 0 0.64. And you get p hat is equal to 0 0.36. So to change that into the smallest number and the largest number of patients, um, the smallest number, that would be 64 patients out of the 100, and that would be 36 patients out of the 100. So X is 64 and X is 36. These are, um, these are proportions of our, our 100 patients. Okay, so that's the end of that exam. If you have any questions um, about any of the questions, just leave them in the comments below. I'll try and get back as soon as I can. Um, thanks for watching.